Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. to another episode of movie house memories the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history i'm patrick and with me as always are three people who spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters first he's the uh, the author of duty honor empire a 25th century love story and the man that all the kids in his neighborhood call papa elf before sitting on his lap and he doesn't even celebrate christmas chris haley i prefer him six three and above (laughs) (laughs) all right and also with us is the woman who makes me feel real warm when i'm around her and my tongue swells up Lori flores (laughs) are you gonna sing for us now he loves it when you sing (laughs) you know he doesn't all right (laughs) and finally he's the youngest member of our group and the man who makes me feel real warm inside when i'm around him and my tongue swells up (laughs) <laughs> Babies, it's cold outside. All right. And this week, uh, I thought he made your rocket uh, fully charged. <laughs> oh, we can get into that in- innuendo much later. So, and this week, how we're... can you take such an innocent film and do this? <laughs> okay. First of all, it's Will Ferrell, so it's not an innocent movie, but uh, we'll see. And this <laughs> week, we're... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And this week, we're contractually obligated to review Laurie's next pick, which appears to be Elf, uh, Elf from 2003 as one of the 100 greatest films of all time. And her selection for her, this is your first holiday selection. I did Night of the Living Dead for Halloween last year. Yeah. Does that count? Well, not for Christmas, but or the holidays. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unless you're really twisted, but that could be so. I don't know. Last year, Chris and Matt had It's a Wonderful Life and A Nightmare Before Christmas. So this year, you and I have the holiday films. So, And you picked Elf. Could have picked White Christmas. Could have picked Miracle on 34th Street. Could have picked Holiday Inn. You picked Elf. I did. All right, Laurie, do you have a summary of the film? I actually do. Okay, please spend the next 30 seconds summarizing the film. (laughs) It's probably not my best summary, but... It'll do. It's probably not your best movie pick either. So. <laughs> Can you tell me a story? It's Christmas Eve and Santa is making his rounds. A baby in an orphanage crawls out of his crib and into Santa's bag. When the hitchhiker is discovered at the North Pole, Papa Elf raises the little one as an elf and names him Buddy. But the growing boy just doesn't fit in because of his size and his lack of elfish talent. As Buddy, played by Will Ferrell, develops into a discouraged man, Papa Elf decides that it is time to tell Buddy the truth about where he came from. Buddy learns for the first time of his deceased mother and living father that is on the naughty list. Buddy sets off through the candy cane forest to New York City to find his family. In the big city, Buddy is able to track down his father, Walter Hobbs, played by James Caan, who never knew he existed and is not happy to meet this quirky man that eagerly calls him dad. Walter has a patient wife, portrayed by Mary Steenburgen, and a son named Michael that that come to accept Buddy as part of their family and force Walter to attempt a relationship with his long-lost son. Buddy enthusiastically tours the city where he finds the world's best cup of coffee. He lands a job at a department store where he meets and falls for Jovi, played by Zoe Deschanel, who is working as an elf. Buddy loses this job when he calls out the fake and intoxicated store Santa and they get into a huge brawl. Walter gives Buddy a job at his company where Buddy causes havoc for Walter and they have a falling out. Walter does not care about the quality of his books and only cares about making money. Buddy disrupts an important meeting between Walter and Miles Finch, a successful author who happens to also be height challenged. Walter is infuriated and tells Buddy to get out of his life. 
but he is hurt and runs away. As he roams the streets of New York City on Christmas Eve, he sees Santa and his team in distress in Central Park. Buddy tries to help Santa fix his sleigh, but it won't run because there isn't enough Christmas spirit. Jovi remembers Buddy telling her the best way to spread Christmas cheer is to sing loud for all to hear. Jovi begins singing Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and as others on the street and watching live news reports on television and even Walter join in, the sleigh begins to run. Santa's job is saved. Yay! <laughs> Papa Elf <laughs> updates the audience with the rest of the story. Buddy and Jovi marry and visit the North Pole with their little one, and Walter is rehabilitated and founds his own successful publishing company. His first book is Buddy's True Story. Everyone lives happily ever after and has a Merry Christmas. Yay! All right. Uh, films are not made in a vacuum. They are influenced by the times that they're made in, and we look back at some of the headlines of those times in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time. Ho, ho, ho. Um, the United States and Britain declare war on Iraq. What year? In March. 2003. Okay. <laughs> Did I not say that? Not yet. <laughs> the year is... He just wasn't sure which time you were talking about. <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. Okay. That was a good Typically, time. It, we know by the, the type of doom and gloom... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that are in the war, war, death, death. Postage stands at 15 cents. <laughs> hey, I don't write the news. I just report it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Baghdad fell in April and tyrant Saddam Hussein was captured in December of 2003. Um, Libya agrees to pay reparations to families of victims of the airplane shot down over Lockerbie, Scotland in 1988. Um, the space shuttle Columbia exploded, killing all seven astronauts. Moviegoers flocked to see The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Pirates of the Caribbean, for which Johnny Depp was nominated for an Oscar, Finding Nemo, Keep on Swimming, Keep on Swimming, <laughs> and Freaky Friday, to name a few. Nora Jones dominated freaky, the Grammy. It's Freaky Friday. Come on. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, obviously not the Jodie Foster one. Yeah, the one that would, I would identify with my generation, not that uh, an abortion of a film that had funny. Lindsay Lohan. I like that movie, and I thought Jamie Lee Curtis was really good in that. I, like, I thought Jamie Lee Curtis made that second movie. All right, whatever. Uh, well, notable it wasn't death. Lindsay. <laughs> she was good in it. <laughs> Notable deaths that year were Bob Hope, Gregory Hines, John and Johnny and June Cash, Catherine Hepburn, Mr. Rogers, and John Ritter. Death, 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 death. <laughs> and last but not least. <laughs> the postage stamp was. <laughs> no, I, I didn't think you needed to know that. Gas <laughs> prices. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to shock you all. California Governor Gray Davis lost in a recall election, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected governor of California. And he'll be back. That's it. All right. I didn't write that. That was just for a moment. Oh, that was spontaneous comedy. <laughs> I'm not good at comedy. I know that. <laughs> All right, we usually begin our discussions with talking about the casting of the film, and obviously this film is uh, dominated by the lead actor in it, which was Will Ferrell in his first, essentially, lead role. He'd been in old school as kind of a co-lead, but this is the first time he's headlining a film. Uh, Laura, I'll let you start, since this is your film. What did you think of Will Ferrell, who does not strike me as a comedian that you would like? I like him in this film, and I love him in Zoolander. Okay. <laughs> I think those are his two best performances. <laughs> I think he's perfect for this role because he's tall and and he just ha he comes across as so innocent and he's hilarious. I, I love him. I love in this movie. I, I I didn't. I thought Will Ferrell was just trying way too hard <laughs> in this movie. It was it was just over the top. And I'm not against Will Ferrell either. I thought he was funny in Zoolander and The Anchorman. This was not his best work. Okay. Chris? I, you know, you can tell this was the beginning of his movie career. 
I think he had a lot of good points in this. I did think he was able to pull off the uh, innocent. Uh, I think he uh, played off James Caan very well. You know, I, I think for this film, it, it, he did a, su- a sufficient job. Not great, but, you know, just sufficient. Well, I'm going to surprise uh, Laurie especially. This is my favorite Will Ferrell movie. And that's not saying a lot, Laurie, so don't get too excited <laughs> yet. Because I'm not going to say that Will Ferrell's one of my favorite actors by any stretch of the imagination. But one thing I do like about him as a comedian is that he has no ego. He will try any joke re- regardless of how ridiculous it may make him look or feel. And that, you know, that and that goes back to when he was on SNL is that he would just how far he would take the joke was always impressive to me when he was on the show. That it, There's no modesty. There doesn't appear to be any kind of um, embarrassment about, you know, committing to the joke. And he will commit. And he committed to this role. And I think it works for him in this film. It was... It, it, he he plays the innocent character very, very well that, uh, you know, interesting doing research on this film that this was developed in the 90s for Jim Carrey. And I have a hard time seeing Jim Carrey play the same role because Jim Carrey doesn't play the somewhat innocent character that much, even though he'll play a dumb character, but he won't play a kind of innocent. I think Will Ferrell will, uh, will, could do it much better. I, I, I thought the, the strength of this film was Will Ferrell. Now, let's talk about one of the weaknesses of this film, James Caan. And we'll let Matt start since last week he did he insisted we talk about James Caan during The Godfather. Wait, that was James Caan? Yeah, I know. You didn't realize it. Did you recognize that it was James Caan in this one? <laughs> yes. No, yeah, I did. You know, I thought, he, I thought he did really well. I, I'm wondering if I gave him a bad rap, if I, if I need to reevaluate my, uh, my – uh, take on James Con entire career. I think you do. I, having just edited that portion, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought I thought he was really good. At times, he he did seem a little um, out of his element. You know, like perhaps there were some f words he felt like should have been used, <laughs> but he couldn't, or something like that. But I thought he was the best thing in the movie. You didn't get the impression that he was going to go grab a trash can and go like on Will Ferrell like Carlo and Godfather real quick? <laughs> yeah, I thought perhaps there was a um, a uh, fire hydrant beat down coming at any moment. <laughs> See, I liked him in this film because um, I, I do think that he worked really well with Will Ferrell. And he, you, you know the type of uh, movie James Conn's going to do, the type of performance he's going to do. And he wasn't fully able to do that, and I think it worked in this film. I've kind of mentioned this, you know, briefly before this podcast that I think that this is a remake of What About Bob just set at Christmas time. And the thing about What About Bob was that that I liked was that Richard Dreyfuss, who usually played these, you know, tougher out there characters, uh, was able to kind of be reeled in and with Bill Murray's character. And I think this was the same kind of dynamic with James Conn and Will Ferrell. And I think it is a good formula when you get two er- two characters that can, that can play off each other like this. I thought he was perfect for the part and I thought he did a, a fabulous job. He was, I, I just love the way he would, you know, so, sometimes kind of mumble under his breath and then his temper could flare quickly. <laughs> I just thought, the chemistry, as has been said, between w- Will Ferrell and, and James Conn was perfect. I mean, they, they played so well off of each other. I think they were perfectly cast. Are we going to talk about Ed Asner? I really liked him as the manager at the department store. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Do you have anything else to add to that? <laughs> that was all I wanted to say about Ed Asner. All you right. know, once you get out of uh, the North Pole, people tend to tan up pretty quick. That's true. All right. I, someone has to be the naysayer, and it's going to be me. I think uh, James Conn is slumming in this film, and he looks bored and uninterested and doesn't bring really kind of any energy to his role whatsoever. And it, as much as there are many things that I think work in this film, many actors that I think do a very, very good job, he's, I think, the, the has the worst performance in this film. And he just doesn't – I mean, it looks like – Okay, when uh, when can when are you gonna say cut? When can I go get craft services? That's that's what he seems to be doing most of the time to me. He just looks so uninterested. But you guys all was it, it was it that or uh, do you think it, it was just a poorly written part? 
I, I think you, you I, just don't like his performance. I just don't like his performance. I think the part is there. It, it's it fits what it needs to be. I just don't think there's any energy to it. I don't. Uh, there's no sincerity to it. Even his kind of transformation to kind of belief at the end of the film seems eh, kind of just. It, it, it's not. He doesn't sell it to me. And and the big oh he's going to start singing and then Santa Slay starts to take off. It just he doesn't even really. You know, doesn't even sell that portion of it to me. But uh, for as good as Will, F- Will Ferrell is, I think James Caan is the kind of the other side of the coin is the, is the worst performance in the film. But there's Can another. Get coal in your stocking. No, I didn't criticize <laughs> Santa. I criticized you know James Caan. I'm gonna get my ass beat. Is what's gonna happen if he ever runs into me? But just just steer clear of garbage cans. Yeah, it's true. Uh, what about uh, what a performance that I liked and I think is an unappreciated comedian and actor, and I don't understand why he hasn't done more films in his career is Bob Newhart. And I thought he brought a lot of comedy to his brief portions of the film. Uh, what did you guys think of Newhart? See, I don't think he's underappreciated. I, I do know that he, he should be in more. I agree with you that he should be in more films, but um, I think he's a very appreciated actor. Um I like just about everything Bob Newhart ever does. And if uh, you want to, I think he is definitely one of the strengths of this film, you know, as short of a time that he's in this, he, he knows how to tell a story. He knows how to deliver it extremely well. And um, yeah, he was a great, great addition to this, uh, to this film. And the the wonderful thing about Bob Newhart is he always speaks in that, that way of speaking that he has and it always fits whatever he does. And you never think, Oh, he's doing this. I never think, Oh, he's doing this again. I love Bob Newhart. I thought he was great. I was looking for Daryl and his other brother, Daryl, but, (laughs) but I, I, I I just thought that was a treat for him to be in that role. And they were working in the mail room, just a little FYI. Oh, Oh, thank you. (laughs) Uh, I, like Lori, always watch, uh, enjoy watching Bob Newhart play Bob Newhart, and in this case, a smaller version of Bob Newhart. So as long as you're using it right, it's great. Uh, in this case, I thought I thought they did it right, but it's just more Bob Newhart. But, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, 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 there's nothing wrong with that. All right, now the proportion that I believe will be a challenge to our two fellows on here <laughs> The symbolism in this film. Chris, what is the deeper meaning and hidden symbolism in Elf? Well, it's a very racist film. <laughs> Basically, um, uh, Will, Will Ferrell's character, Buddy, he had the, the nerve to think that he was like all the elves. I mean, he had the same Christmas cheer. Sure, he couldn't make 95 Etch-A-Sketches in a minute like the other guys with smaller hands. But, you know... Um, he worked hard and he still was never accepted, even though he, he never did anything to the other elves. And eventually they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, you're not one of us. Beat it. And once he had a talk with uh, Leon Redbone's snowman, uh, he decided it was time to go to New York. Yeah, but once he gets to New York, he excels at everything. I mean, his Christ- Christmas decorations of the toy store are phenomenal. Everything he does there is to the nth degrees to show that he, although he may be, you know, the slow person and prejudice against there, he has exceptional ability in the human world, and yet they still treat him differently. They still look down upon him. He'll beat your brains in in a snowball fight. That's true. <laughs> it's one of those where you uh, try and move out of your neighborhood to uh, better yourself and you're never fully accepted in that new world. And then when you return to the old world, you're never accepted again because you dared to uh, dream and live a different life. Except he was right. accepted. Well, he was only accepted after those um, those Lord of the Ring horses uh, chased him through the park and made everybody sing. You know what? I just had a thought. <laughs> Everybody paused. If, 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 I had, if I had a sound effect, it'd go ding. <laughs> um, well, we'll make one. <laughs> this isn't What About Bob. This is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer redone. Well, yeah, because the characters, the elves are wearing the exact same costumes as in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the claymation. <laughs> they did that on purpose. They did? Yes. Hey, did yeah. you guys know... 
that um, <laughs> the boy from a Chris that Ralph from a Christmas story is it one of is, the elves? Yes, I was so excited when I found that out. Did you know he's an Iron Man too? Or, no, me, Iron Man as well. Robert Downey no. Jr. played Ralphie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's the kid who stuck his tongue to the pole. <laughs> No, Peter Bing Billingsley. He's and they, they told him there was crack on that pole. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing nobody important actually listens to our podcast. <laughs> but now we're oh. going to loop it into a ninety-minute episode. You just, <laughs> yeah. you just insulted our audience of four. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you just insulted our crack listeners. There's like nobody from the Christmas story is ever going to use arm smack. We'll edit that. Out. Come on. <laughs> I mean, Robert Downey Jr. was using drugs in the 80s, and Christmas Story was made in the 80s, so that only makes sense. Of course he was doing, you know, crack back then, whatever. So, no, Peter B Billingsley is one of the scientists at the end of Iron Man that gets killed by the Jeff Bridges character. I didn't know that. Yeah. He's got That's his head That's why you never shaved. use a BB gun in an Iron Man fight. <laughs> it's true. You'll shoot your eye out. Yeah. So we really digress there. <laughs> <laughs> We went from Elf to a good film. <laughs> Patrick, you have issues. We're, we're spreading holiday cheer. <laughs> spreading something. Yeah. Okay, Matt, what about the uh, moral universe question in this film? Well, I, you know, there it really isn't one. What I thought well, was I interesting think there is, it, is there a Santa Claus? That's the moral universe question. And I believe the answer uh, is yes. Okay. But I, I thought it was interesting when you compare this to other Christmas movies, how this one really just seemed like it was Christmas for Christmas sake. Like, you know, a lot of times your, your holiday movies, you've got some kind of moral payoff, like, hey, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to men, be nice, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I guess James Conn character goes through his little transformation, but the whole thing just it kind of felt forced. And, you know, the whole point was, well, just believe in Santa Claus and everything's cool. I, I thought that was <laughs> A little, a little disappointing. I usually, I usually like my uh, Christmas movies to be a little more, I don't know, heavy-handed, spiritually enriching. Yeah, you know. Oh, let I me like tell you what the moral universe <laughs> this week. <laughs> Take it away, Lori. <laughs> Apparently, Lori's been drinking this week because she's talking a lot. <laughs> she's okay. got the just, eggnog going. <laughs> just be yourself and family is important that's the moral universe for this week i, I would agree with Lori on that that the, the the importance of the family is the the center point of james Conn's transition and he's literally pretty much the only character that kind of goes through any kind of metamorphosis or grows in any way buddy is the same throughout buddy is unaffected by the world around him even when things go most back. retards are <laughs> You are not to use the R word on this podcast. You know, that reminds me, Chris, that probably more than Three the is. reindeer. This, this is just a much more lighthearted rain man, really. There's no Wapner. Instead of fish sticks, he just eats candy. That's true. <laughs> That's a candy and spaghetti. And syrup. But the only character that goes through any kind of transformation is the James Conn character. And it, and that's why I said is that he he's the emotional trans, transformation that this film has to make. And that's why I say I say it, he doesn't sell it. And that's where this film, I think, ultimately fails. It's just he's just kind of going, uh, I'm going through the motion. And, he, and even his character doesn't commit. He's seen Santa Claus. He's there to help Buddy. And he won't even sing at the end of the film until the last minute. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it, it's not a genuine tra transformation. It's the same thing of him just sitting there mouthing the words. Uh, that's the what I see the performance of Jimmy Kahn is he's mouthing the words throughout the film is he didn't really, really sell. Uh, he, he didn't change as a character in this film at all. Well, and if their message was that you have to give up money to have a family, I already know that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is very true. All right, let's talk about the ending of the film. Can the film be any more Hollywood? And also the question, can a Christmas movie end any other way? By definition, yes, it was a holiday ending. Is that a problem for me? No. Holiday or Hollywood? Did I say holiday? <laughs> I like it. She blended both your questions together into one that's, good answer. That's true. It that. started off Christmas, but it ended summertime. I don't know what happened. 
<laughs> Just for the record, I don't need eggnog. I have Christmas spirit. <laughs> did you decorate a tree before you did your synopsis today? That spirit, Jack Daniels. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, that's it. I think we've had enough for Lori. Why don't you go have another glass? Matt? Oh, it's as Hollywood as can be. And it's the way a Christmas movie should end. Well, a Christmas movie like this. I mean, this this is just a – it's a popcorn movie for the holidays. It should be as, you know, treacly as this one was. And, you know, audiences got exactly what they went for. Chris? Yeah, this wasn't a really challenging film. It was just meant to be a happy, feel-good movie. So I don't think that there were, it was really necessary to do anything but a Hollywood ending. You know, uh, what was the girl's name in this film? The female jo- character, the blonde? Joby. You know, she conquered her figure of singing in public. And in theory, James Caan got his family and vice versa. And Buddy got him a girl to get busy with. Uh, you know, you just can't get too much more Hollywood than that. His tongue swelled for years after, I'm sure. <laughs> it's about love. I had a question for you guys. I put it on the outline. You probably don't know what the context of it was. So I'll frame the question to cause some, I don't know, debate is, you know, the question I put to you guys, is why do Christmas movies usually suck? <laughs> and And let me preface this that, I don't think all Christmas movies are bad or terrible, but I do believe that Christmas movies that delve too deeply or in, envelop themselves too much into Christmas don't uh, they they tie themselves so much to the holiday that the the storyline becomes predictable, boring, uninteresting, and the truly great Christmas films have something else that going on besides just the holiday itself. Uh, a la, White Christmas, uh, Love Actually, I think is a great Christmas movie, although it's not really about Christmas. It's more about uh, love relationships. It's a more of a romance film. Uh, I would even go as far as to say Die Hard, which we're going to review in a couple of weeks, is, is one of my favorite Christmas movies, is that's not the basis, you know, that's not the sole basis of the film. But if you get too deeply into it, like uh, Christmas Vacation, which is one of my holiday favorites, but it's not really a good film. It's just a really good Christmas film because most of them aren't very good. Christmas story, I think is an overrated film and it, it's, you know, just entrenched in Christmas. And then this film as well. I mean, you you get Christmas with the cranks. I mean, there could be an endless list of Christmas movies. Why do you think, you know, why do you think uh, Christmas movies just aren't very, very good most of the time that are so enveloped in Christmas? I think it's because you're just a cynical jerk. <laughs> that that could be true too. No, I, I I hear what you're saying. I think it's a delicate balance of of doing of having a Christmas theme and not overdoing what can turn into sappiness really quick if you don't balance it well. One of my favorite movies about Christmas has very little to do with Christmas as well. Brazil. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Yes, I have. And, it's, a, it's a Christmas is involved. I don't remember that. It, it's Christmas time is oh. pretty much where, yeah, it's, it's that you probably wouldn't even think of it as a Christmas because there's so little in it. But if you can lump Die Hard into a Christmas film, this can be, Brazil can be as well. But um, I, I think it, there's just a very delicate balance with overdoing a Christmas theme. And far more often than not, it's overdone. Do do you think it's if you get too deep into it that you just uh, my viewpoint is that it just if you get too deep into Christmas that it ties your hands that you you either you know you dip your toe in the water or you just go jumping into the deep end and once you go and jumping in the deep end that a Christmas film dictates certain pretenses that everything must be happy at the end and there cannot be any kind of disappointment or uh, regret and that's that's why I think there's a lot of them have fault. I don't know. I, it's kind of like where you talk about why people like Batman more instead of Superman nowadays, just how the attitudes have changed. And it might be a little bit of that. You know, Christmas films might be the Superman where uh, more people's tastes are along the lines of a Batman darkness to it. So uh, they you don't always want this happiness, sugar and sweetness that goes along with it. Matt? Well, I, I think you answered it when you were framing the question. It's that 
really good movies are about things about the human experience. They they teach you a little more about yourself. And if you just want to make a Christmas movie, it's really hard to get anything – get into much that's really human. And and I think Christmas has that in itself too. There's the, the part of it where it's just kind of a fun to, to pretend and it's, it's you know like a fantasy land kind of creeps out in the real world for a little bit. And there's also that element too that can create a lot more introspection and thoughtfulness and maybe change the way people treat each other a little bit. So I, I think a lot of people just want to go have fun for 90 minutes and not think about life. And that creates a lot of bad Christmas movies that are fun for 90 minutes. Then you're done with them for the rest of your life. And so I, I think, you know, it's all in there, but a lot of it's just you're, you're pigeonholing yourself into something very superficial and it's, it'll be fun and it'll be forgettable. I completely disagree with you all. I think there's a place for Christmas movies. <laughs> Why are you laughing so hard? It's in a place right next to the musicals. Oh, who said that, Matt? No, that was me. I, I did not say that. <laughs> okay. Although I did really appreciate either your preface to your response. <laughs> I I just, I, I mean, Matt, I, I agree with some of what you said about why we watch movies and but I think there's a place for Christmas movies, and I think if it's well done, it doesn't get bogged down. I think this one is well done, um, the, but the reason it's it's in my on my list of top movies is because it's a, a probably an emotional one. It's a family tradition, and our family quotes it all the time. It's funny. It makes me feel good. I love the music. Um, I love all of the Christmas songs they chose. I love the Jovi scene when she sings Baby It's Cold Outside. I just think this movie works, and I think it's a classic. All right, well, let's talk about the film's legacy. Released in 2003, grossed over $220 million worldwide on initial release. Uh, won Best Comedy in the Golden Trailer Awards. I don't know what that is, but it won an award, so it's an well, award golden. winner. It's golden. Whatever that. What I have that? no exactly. That's what that was kind of. That the doesn't joke. sound good. Uh, it was made into a Broadway musical in 2011. Uh, I did not know that. Yes, uh, I apparently it comes. Back, my understanding is it comes back every uh, every holiday season for a limited run. It only ran for a brief period of time. Uh, it has an animated television sequel that was released in November 2014. Uh, and just to clarify, the Golden Trailer Awards are given out for the best movie previews <laughs> and, and i'm not joking oh that makes sense that makes sense <laughs> is not in the national film registry and rotten tomatoes uh 84 yeah 84 percent critics 78 percent audience uh so the legacy for this film uh we'll start with we'll go alphabetical chris uh are you surprised of anything about the legacy in this film and would you put it in your 100 greatest films of all time no, I, I'm not terribly surprised. I mean, it's not an, a film that I think stands out from everything, but it is an enjoyable Christmas film. It's not in my top 100, but I do like to watch this at Christmas time. I think Will Ferrell is very endearing. I think uh, Bob Newhart is great in this. And I, I like James Caan, even though you don't like his performance in this. I like the fact that this tough guy actor uh, gets basically made fun of indirectly by Will Ferrell throughout this film. You know, I think Rotten Tomatoes has pretty much nailed it with the audience um, because I would say this would be like a 75% rating for me. I also like something we didn't mention was I like that Leon Redbone was the snowman um, because one of my favorite Christmas songs of all time is Leon Redbone's version of Frosty the Snowman. So that uh, amuses me every time I see him in it, too. Matt? No, the the um, legacy does does not surprise me. And I don't particularly care for this movie. But I think it's got something going for it. I, I I know a lot of people who really like this movie. They like to watch it around around Christmas time. I can see why uh, Lori and her family have kind of incorporated into their their Christmas traditions and stuff like that. It's got it's got some charm. It's just not my kind of movie. So I'm going to leave it out of my top 100. Well, Lori, 
It's not in my top 100, but it's a film I do like. I do enjoy. It's just nowhere near my top 100. It's one of those films, kind of as I described, that at that Christmas season when uh, things I'm looking for something simpler and something just entertain me is kind of as Matt described. It's a film that I know I will sit down with my family and watch. In fact, this year we watched it a little bit earlier than normal, but it is it is kind of a holiday tradition, much as yours. Uh, and I watch Christmas Vacation, and I watch Bad Santa. I watch Love Actually. I have a long list of holiday films that I watch every single year, and none of them are generally that good, but they are there are traditions, and I think that this has just fallen into that tradition. I do like Will Ferrell in it. Uh, I do not like James Caan in it by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, but Lori, this is your film, so you have the final word. Tell us what you think. I love this film. It is in my top 100. I We didn't discuss Zoe Dashnell. I, if I'm, I don't know that I'm saying her name right. No, I think you're, I think you're uh, saying it right. I love her in this movie. And I I think that her the her singing voice is amazing and stuff and she's part of what makes this such a wonderful film, but I I love this movie and I think it's very well made and well cast and I don't think it's just for the sentimental reasons I think I would love it even if it wasn't a Christmas movie and a a family tradition. That does it for this week's review of Elf. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on our upcoming podcasts on either Movie House Memories, Lunchtime Movie Review, or Mail Bonding. Additionally, if you've uh, enjoyed yourselves and you've downloaded us off iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Uh, join us in a couple of weeks when I get to make my first Christmas pick, which is already, already the aforementioned Die Hard, which is also a Christmas tradition in my household, watching that film. So Die Hard in two weeks. Sometimes Christmas has action and bullets. And bare feet and glass. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for you to say that. Wish you would have finished it. Uh, until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Ebola Free. <laughs> I'm Lori. And I'm Matt. And we'll see you all next time at our house. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incomputech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.